This is where one of the great rivers of the world slows down, sprawls out, and spills into the sea. 150 square miles of tidal flats, marshes, and shallow brackish water. The Columbia River Estuary. It doesn't look like a very important piece of property, does it? But these tidal marshes, mud flats, and adjacent uplands are valuable in two ways. Biologically, a healthy estuary is enormously productive. Simple life forms, fed by nutrients washed from an entire watershed, flourish here and make up the first fragile link in a chain of life that reaches all the way to man. Economically, estuaries are a country's portal to the sea. Most of the world's commerce passes through estuaries, so you find industry, cities, and port facilities clustered here, competing for access to the water. In pursuit of our commercial interest in an estuary, we often ruin its biological productivity. In the next half hour, we're going to take a look at the relationship between the biological health of the Columbia River estuary and the economic health of the Pacific Northwest. Amidst a maze of islands, sloughs, and channels, salt and fresh water meet and mix. On the rising tide, the Pacific Ocean floods in, raising the water level by as much as 12 feet, driving a saltwater wedge 26 miles up the Columbia River. When the tide ebbs, the river's fresh water washes much of the salt back to sea. Fresh water predominates in the Columbia. Its volume has, for centuries, pulsed rhythmically with the passing seasons. In spring, as much as a million cubic feet of water pours into the estuary every second. This constant mixing of the tides and fresh water is responsible for much of the physical character of the estuary and is essential to the biological life here. Many plants and animals have adapted to the rhythms of this ever-fluctuating environment. They thrive in great abundance and form the base of an elaborate food chain. At the base of the chain are microscopic plants called phytoplankton and the remains of larger plants such as sedges and rushes. Tiny animal plankton, insect larvae, and small crustaceans feed on this plant material and in turn are eaten by a variety of fish and shellfish. Salmon and steelhead pass through the estuary as juveniles migrating to the sea and again years later as adults returning to their freshwater birthplaces. As juveniles, they rely upon the estuary's food, shelter, and unique mix of salt and fresh water to help them make the adjustment between the ocean and the river. Seals and sea lions also frequent the lower river, where they feed on a variety of fish and other life in the estuary. Most of the islands in the estuary are set aside as wildlife refuges. The endangered Colombian white-tailed deer thrives here. So do Roosevelt elk. More than 175 kinds of birds, including nesting colonies of great blue herons, the threatened bald eagle, and a major concentration of wintering waterfowl all live or migrate through here. Hunting and fishing lifestyles have thrived on the abundance here for more than 10,000 years.
For decades, life here has moved to unchanged seasonal rhythms. Fishermen in pursuit of the river salmon. Generations of men, women, and children have come down to the river to build their boats and floating houses, to live and to fish. Much of the economy of this region is based on a healthy, productive estuary. But other segments of the economy sometimes prosper at the expense of the estuary and its biological health. Farmers were attracted to the lower river by the rich black soil. By the 1930s, two-thirds of these wetlands had been diked and drained. Although skeletons are all that remain for some of these farms, the majority of the drained acreage is still in agriculture. In general, the logging industry isn't affected by the biological health of the estuary. Rather, an economically healthy logging industry has affected the biological life here. Many logging practices cause soil and debris to flood into the estuary and bury once productive shallow water areas. The logging industry depends upon the estuary for convenient storage space, efficient waterways for moving the logs to awaiting ships, and its direct link with the sea and foreign markets. The economy of this entire region depends upon logging. Logs comprise 99% of the tonnage exported from the port of Astoria. The timber industry employs more people than any other in the area. Revenues exceed a half billion dollars per year. The estuary is becoming more and more important for ocean ships shuttling the global trade routes. While a few of these freighters stop and load logs at the port of Astoria, most simply cut paths through the estuary, headed 100 miles inland to Portland, Oregon. Every year, 30 million tons of commerce steam past the small port cities of Warrington, Hammond, Iwako, Kathlamet, and Astoria. Astoria serves as a port of call for merchant ships and fishing vessels, some of them seeking shelter from the storm-tossed North Pacific. Fog, rain, and violent winds prowl the northwest coast, claiming ships and lives. Mariners call the entrance to the Columbia River estuary Graveyard of the Pacific. The skeletons of more than a hundred ships lie in and around the mouth of the Columbia. At Cape Disappointment, the Coast Guard maintains navigational aids and helps ships pick their way across the perilous bar. To make a dangerous passage safer, jetties were built on either side of the river mouth in the late 1800s. The jetties altered tidal and river currents, concentrating them in ways that helped scour the ship channel. But it's not enough. Constant dredging must still be done throughout the estuary to keep the channel open. For many years, 
these dredged materials were simply piped from the ship channel to other areas within the estuary. Not much was known then about the damaging effects the dredged sand and mud would have on productive shallow water areas. In recent years, care has been used in finding more appropriate disposal sites. The Columbia, like all great rivers, is often used as a waste disposal system. Coast Guard helicopters regularly fly pollution patrols in an effort to monitor and control what's dumped into the river. With these techniques, the Coast Guard can monitor only the largest discharges. More subtle, but also more important, are the agricultural chemicals, pesticides, oil spills, storm sewer drainage, and sewage. No one really knows how much of these wastes spill into the river, nor what exactly their effect on biological life. For the most part, the estuary looks healthy enough. All the draining, dredging, and filling seem, at a glance, to have done little harm. But that's because the Columbia conceals her scars well. In fact, we have done damage here. And not just by our exploitation in and around the estuary itself. Activities just as destructive take place far upriver. The Columbia River estuary is a critical and vulnerable link in a much larger system. It's the neck of a funnel that drains a quarter million square miles of seven states and British Columbia. If we're to understand what's happening to the estuary, we must look to its source. We must follow the water from the time it melts and runs off the high Rocky Mountains until it reaches the Pacific. The Columbia River gathers on the western slope of the Continental Divide from as far away as Canada and Montana. From the time it cascades out of the mountains until it reaches the Pacific, the Columbia's water will be used and reused, coveted, diverted, and contaminated, heated, treated, and mistreated. But here in the high canyon country of Idaho, it rushes clean and cold, one of the West's few wild rivers. The Boise, the Snake, the Yakima, and many others once ran free to the Columbia, the estuary, and the sea. In the spring, these rivers carried a great flush of water, sediment, and debris that flooded into the estuary and replenished it. The spring surge was the lifeblood of the estuary, and the Columbia River was the artery that carried it. For time immeasurable, young salmon and steelhead hatched in small tributary streams and followed the runoff to the sea. These wild headwaters represented the origin of life for both salmon and the Columbia. But today, many of these streams lie beneath giant reservoirs. Anderson Ranch, Hungry Horse, Grand Coulee. The harnessed river system provides a stable source of water, cheap hydropower, even a place to play. The vast interconnected reservoirs have become a highway to the sea. From as far away as Lewiston, Idaho, commerce flows uninterrupted 500 miles to the Pacific. Wheat from Washington, potatoes from Idaho, 8 million tons each year through the Cascades. The reservoirs have become a boon to farmers as well. 
Clusters of huge electric pumps suck mountain rainwater and snowmelt from the Columbia, bringing life to desert soils, creating agricultural wealth where sagebrush once stood. Today, farmers use 20% of the Columbia's summer flow, seven and a half million acres of alfalfa, corn, and potatoes, worth three billion dollars. The Columbia Snake River system contains one half of all the hydroelectric generating capacity in the United States, 18 billion kilowatts to fuel the Northwest's economy. Without the dams, the Northwest could not have developed as it has. Industry, jobs, they're tied to the abundance of cheap hydropower. In the early days, the river's power and water supply seemed unlimited. Industry was attracted to the river by the cheap power, and with industry came people. Demand for electricity and water quickly rose to meet supply, and today competing demands often exceed the capacity of even this great river. We built nearly 200 dams to harness the Great River's power, store her water, and control her floods. But in the process, something was lost. Many wild rivers were drowned. The nutrients and soil in the spring rush of water settled out at the bottoms of the reservoirs. The seasonal rhythms of water were interrupted, and some of the salmon runs disappeared. Many of the dams were built without fish ladders, and as a result, half of all the spawning streams of the Columbia River system were cut off to salmon. Wherever fish ladders were built, the returning adult salmon had a fighting chance to reach their spawning streams, but providing for the young salmon on their way back to sea has proven to be even more difficult. It's estimated that 15% of all the juvenile salmon passing through a single reservoir and dam are killed. The salmon resource has declined, partly due to overfishing, but also for some of the same reasons that other biological life in the estuary has suffered. Demand for the river's water, changes in its flow, loss of habitat, and pollutants in the water. In the case of salmon, a great deal of time and money is being spent to undo the damage. State and federal agencies have spent a half billion dollars on fish passage and propagation facilities. These hatcheries were designed to replace thousands of miles of shallow gravel streams which were cut off to migrating salmon by the construction of high dams. Despite all this effort, maintaining upriver runs is becoming increasingly difficult. The big problem seems to be getting the juvenile salmon to successfully pass through the reservoirs and dams. Until permanent fish passage solutions can be found and applied, the National Marine Fisheries Service and the Corps of Engineers are collecting salmon and barging them through the reservoirs and around the dams, their lethal turbines and spillways. In a record year around the turn of the century, 49 million pounds of salmon were caught and processed here. More recently, the catch has been one-tenth that figure. As salmon catches on the Columbia declined, the economic health of the region was shaken. Hardest hit were the fishermen. Indians in upriver areas and non-Indian gill netters far downstream built their lives upon salmon. When the runs fell off, a way of life withered too. Abandoned boats and buildings attest to the hard times 
here in Astoria. Rows of waterfront salmon canneries were swept away by the tides of economic change. These abandoned buildings are common to the Astoria area. They're an example of how an estuary and the people who depend upon it are affected by human activities all along the river. But to paint a completely bleak picture wouldn't be exactly accurate. The salmon runs on the Columbia are not lost. Wild runs are on the verge of extinction, but state and federal hatcheries now raise and release 170 million fish each year. These fish become the base for an offshore fishery that extends from the jetties to Alaska and halfway to Japan. There is no doubt that the Columbia River salmon resource and the fishery have been damaged by changes in the river's flow. The dams, their reservoirs, water diversion, and contamination all have affected the river, the estuary, and the salmon and in ways that were never fully predicted. Gone are most of the in-river fishermen. Gone are the huge salmon canneries and many of the jobs. But in their place is an international offshore commercial fishery and a sport fishing industry. These environmental changes have caused economic and cultural hardships for some people, while others seem to have prospered. As the salmon industry in the Columbia declined, other fish and other industries took up some of the slack in the economy. For example, some fishermen and processors shifted to tuna, shrimp, rockfish, and ling cod. But these species now support only a small fraction of the jobs once provided by salmon alone. Competition for water frontage is keen. Where canneries once processed Royal Columbia River Chinook salmon, shops and restaurants now cater to tourists. Many come to dine on dockside fresh seafood, seafood from, or in part dependent upon, the estuary outside the restaurant windows. Especially during years of low rainfall, competing demands for the river's water exceed supply. And yet every year there are greater and greater demands. Demands to divert the river's water to the arid southwestern states. Demands to build more dams. Demands to dredge and fill productive tidelands and deepen channels for new port and industrial facilities. The sharp decline of the fishing industry has forced the communities in the Astoria area to look elsewhere for income. New port facilities proposed here would mean more jobs and an economic boost. As these demands grow, the effects on the biological health of the estuary and on salmon are destined to grow too. Astoria's vitality has emanated from the natural resources of the Columbia River and her estuary. A serious question here is how can these towns undertake the development projects they need to prosper and still preserve the biological health of the estuary? 
Research teams from local, state, and federal agencies and universities have begun gathering the essential environmental information needed to make decisions far into the future. Tough questions are being asked. How will future water withdrawals affect the estuary? What areas must be preserved to protect dwindling salmon resources? Is further channel deepening feasible? Where should new facilities be located and how should they be built? With government assistance, local leaders wrote a comprehensive management plan which provides for all of the projected port and industrial growth and still preserves more than 95% of what's left of the estuary's most productive areas. Over the centuries, we have extracted an immeasurable bounty from the Columbia River estuary and the entire river system. In the process, we have impaired its ability to produce. Impaired, but not destroyed. Not yet. Scientists have only begun the struggle to understand the complex forces working on this estuary. What little we know so far tells us to proceed only with extreme caution if we wish to preserve what's left of the biological productivity here. We must recognize in our decisions that the estuary is a critical, fragile link in a large system, a system that includes the river, much of the adjacent ocean, and the people and communities of the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> 